Now, they've calculated there was hundreds of patients involved, and there is a background malignancy rate that might happen in patients or anybody in, at, at, of these sort of ages. So it's not thought to be over the background rate, but none of us um, can completely sort of not worry about it. So um, that's really going to be something that people will go on watching as to whether if you actually drop the lymphocyte count in the way that cladribine does, whether it actually exposes people to a long-term malignancy uh, rate. And of course, that's partly an issue because with some other very powerful immunosuppressive drugs that have been used in the past, there's also been known to be an increased malignancy rate. Um, there's a, another antibody, which is a um, monoclonal antibody, which has got two names. It's called alemtuzumab officially, and it's often called Campath because it was actually made in Cam Cambridge Pathology Department um, quite a long years ago, so it got uh, called that. This drug is also being tested in this country uh, in the phase three study. Um, and uh, it's been, it gets given to somebody for five days the first year and three days the second year, just five days in a row and then go away and forget about it and then three days the following year. And that immediately has a major effect on lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. They gradually come back. This medication has actually been tried early in the disease as well as late and it really only seems to work early in the disease. So it'll be 2011, 12, 13 before that medication's available. Now I just was going to mention just a little bit about the preclinical work that I'm doing. Um, and I suppose I just wanted to uh, change a little bit and talk about all these different T cells that people have um, um, may have come up beforehand, but in the thymus that we have, which is sort of buried un, uh, under our sternum, we actually make a whole lot of T cells. And we make cells that have different um, little bits on the outside of them, and these, are, these get called by various numbers um, so that we all agree, instead of calling them um, whatever the investigator that discovered it, if they called it by their name, we'd not be able to talk to one another because we wouldn't know all the names. So they, they give them numbers. The CD4 is one of them, the CD25 is another one, and the CD127 is another one. They're quite interesting, actually, because if you look at those, they are the same things that the genetic polymorphisms that uh, I think was discussed in the early... Some of those are, uh, are what's associated, those those unusual genetic relationships are actually relate to those cells exactly. So we think that these cells might be quite important. And we've been trying to look at um, whether uh, there's ways that we can in use the cells that are the CD25 positive ones that are otherwise known as T regulatory cells. And these cells seem to have, the, they exist in all of us, it's always been, it's been thought for a long time that uh, MS patients may not have uh, either quite enough or they may not work quite as well. And uh, people have been trying to work out how to make these uh, grow a little bit better or work better. So w for a variety of reasons, we used a cytokine that's made in the body naturally and we gave it to some animals that had uh, have a, a model of demyelination um, and we only treated the animals once they were already sick. So we can't have created a flat line down the bottom because the animals were already sick, but we made them get significantly better. And when we uh, actually looked at the amount of demyelination, so with those little bar graphs on the um, Right, left-hand side, thank you. Um, you can see the black line is the ones that got treated. Although the animals were getting sick just like the others, they hardly developed any demyelination at all. And, and uh, even seven days later, they also had hardly developed any demyelination. So um, we've been... We've thought that we've got a whole lot of other work that actually looks at how this particular cytokine might work, but what and why we've come to the 
decision to use that one. But what we actually think is that this cytokine is making those special T regulatory cells be expanded and then those cells are naturally turning the disease off. Um, so um, it's uh, what we what we think is that if we use this cytokine, it may be a way of getting people to uh, naturally make cells that would regulate their immune system. We know that actually humans have these cells as well and that they actually respond to IL-5 in the way that they do in the rats. Um, now, I, uh, there's obviously, because as I said, that's sort of preclinical work, there's lots of things to do to make sure that we're actually uh, on the right track, although um, the next phases of that really should be where you test it in primates and then go through the other things. So there's, there's a lot of other, there's a number of other products around as well that are further back in the phase two, phase three thing. So they'll be five years before they're sort of available to us. Um, some of them are tablets, some of them are monoclonal antibodies, but many of them are having effects that are actually uh, look like they're a little bit better than the current medications we have, if not a lot better. Thanks. But Susan, you've been very honest with all the, all the risks involved with the, the promising new treatments that are coming in the next few years. As a neurologist, can you give us a general answer about how you manage, how you see managing the benefits, obviously, to a large portion of the patients who are going to benefit versus the risks involved that you've related and been very honest?